we're talking about up to now, it was 2010 to 2014 was in, in Minor Pay. Mm -hmm. Then 2014 to 2018 was in Bishop. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 2018 to 2019 halfway, I traveled around the world for six months just to relax and have a break. And I didn't have any plans. So I said, you know, this is my time to travel because I've always wanted to travel around the world and go in a globe like that. So I started with the Kampala, Uganda. Then I went up to Serbia, Belgrade, and then went to Japan, went to Australia, went to Fiji, you know, just the whole uh, yeah. trip. And then came back to Hawaii, to the US. And uh, also, oh, from Belgrade, I did go to Paris, London, Italy, just like that, just to see the European main, main cities that I, I had like this bucket list. So mm. I pretty much emptied it and spent about two months in the US seeing friends and family, then uh, back to Asmara. That uh, was the April in 2019. And that then I was just sitting in Asmara looking for Haddas Ertra because that's where all the jobs, uh, good jobs mm. are advertised. Yeah, then I see this job and I'm reading through it and then I didn't quite pay attention to it because my mind was WHO, UNDP, but in Asmara because I really want to stay in Asmara this time. Yeah, yeah. Then, um, so I applied with those and I, and then my cousin said, uh, you know, Ruti, you're, there is an advertisement, uh, a position that really fits your profile. So you might want to look into it, but I don't think it's going to be based here. I'm like, oh, again, I'm going to leave Asmara. No, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm like, okay, let me look through it. And I look at it and it's a CEO. I said, then okay, I read and this exact my qualification. My CV was like a photocopy of that profile. I was like, wow, okay, I could do this one. So I go to Ministry of Trade because that's what the advertisement said. And I look and I say, can I have an application? And the lady goes, oh yeah, sure, you can have the application. Which one do you want to apply for? I said, this position. She goes, oh no, no, that position is a very high position. You will be reporting directly to the Secretary General. So I think you should start maybe look for an admin position so you can slowly work your way up. I'm like, admin position? No, that's okay. Because she doesn't know me. She just looked at me. She said, oh, this little girl, how is she going to be in a, the CEO position? I was like, okay, physically I might look young, but I'm really not young. So let's look at this. I said, just give me the application. I'll bring you my, my CVs and fill it up. Then you can recommend me or not. Because to get a commissar job, you must be recommended by your member state uh, cooperating ministry which is Ministry of Trade and Industry. And so I bring my application. She looked at it, she goes, so, uh, did she call uh, uh, so, Sorry, uh, Ruta. So that means, uh, so let me stop you there. So you cannot get that position unless your country approves it. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Okay. Unless your country approves it, but also unless you are a, a, a citizen of the 21 member states. So you mm. have to be a citizen. So for me, because I have Eritrean uh, passport, mm. I'm Eritrean living in Eritrea as well. But you could be Eritrean living in diaspora anywhere, yeah, but yeah. have an Eritrean passport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Eritrean well, so passport, the country has to approve that position. Is that for all? Exactly. Yeah, all like good and, and organizational positions. Yeah, the ministry. Okay. Exactly. So your ministry approves for you and recommends you to the to be mm -hmm. hired. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there were three or four of us who applied from uh, from Asmara for this, and then they they looked at it and they said, I think I qualified because there were three positions. So uh, they recommended us. So when she looked at my experience and everything, she goes, Pomisa oh, is going to be so lucky to have you. I'm so sorry. I apologize for telling you to step as an admin. You are truly ready for this position. Oh, and, I, and she gave me all the information, all the morale, all the support. Oh, I love the way she just like, you know, she made me feel, okay, I got the position, you know? Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. So... They quickly recommended me. Then uh, the, the interview took a long time. So first, it was Easter time. So Easter came and they're not calling, nobody is. Then I kept uh, trying to email them. They're not responding. So I said, let me take a break and uh, went to Addis Ababa to see my aunt who for the first time after 50 years found out we have an aunt in Addis because of the 2018 peace process in Ethiopia. So I went there, met her children for the first time in our lives and spent a month. And then uh, mom was also there. So me and mom came back to Asmara. So then as soon as we arrived, the interview, uh, they called me for interview. So they told me, come to Lusaka. So they bought me a ticket and they, I flew in. And um, the interview happened. 15 countries' representatives were in the interview. It's just like the Bishop boardroom. I tell you, Bishop prepared me for this because mm -hmm. we were three, four times a week in the boardroom. When I went to interview in the full room of all these big people, like, you know, 
they are representatives of governments from 15 countries and the HR and you know the whole uh, staff, the management staff, because it's a high level position, the high level people interview you yeah. by one by one. The interview lasted like an hour and half almost, because each one had a question and mm -hmm. I had to respond accordingly. And I have no knowledge about trade, business, finance, this, that, this, but my experience is just management. Mm -hmm. So that, but the experiences of what I had in the US and in, you know, in my nephew and also in the Middle East with the Peace Corps, also in, uh, in Bisha, it really gave me all that. And more than anything, the Bisha experience was business. So there was a lot of things I was aware of. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the whole integration, so that, and the business and the business plans and things that we do in Bisha was really relevant for this position. So I was not in the dark completely, but I just didn't know what economic integration and this uh, Pan-African forefathers created for Africa to be united like, uh, economically. So yeah, politically, maybe I was a bit off, but uh, business-wise and um, the, the, the knowledge of what my post will be was on point. So it was... Uh, Quite entertaining to see the politics that's played at a high level positions in Africa. I mean, anywhere is probably similar, but for me, I just treated it like Bisha. And after that, I came out and I they asked me, do you have any question? I asked them certain self-reliant questions. The second question was similarly, like, how, how do you do this integration? Then the secretary general who was leading the interview said, well, if you get this position, you'll get a chance to implement your own questions. I said, oh, mm. okay, thank you. So that was nice. And I felt like, okay, I got this position. So I came out and um, so I told, then I said, so when will we know? Will we know when we go back to Eritrea or will I know now? They said, oh, we'll inform you. And then we left the interview. As soon as we got out, it was June 20th, uh, 19, 2019. And it was Martyr's Day. So as I was going back home, I was, I had a delay about eight hours in the airport in Addis. So I said, I'm not going to sit in the airport. Let me just go to Eritrean embassy. So I go to Eritrean embassy in Addis and we did the Eritrean martyrs celebration that was happening there, the ceremony that was happening there. So I met uh, Ambassador uh, Samara Rassam and uh, the um, Arayadista from the African Union. And uh, as I was shaking his hand, um, Ambassador Arayadista, uh, God bless his soul, he held my hand and he said, Ruth Nagash? I said, yeah. He goes, where were you? I said, oh, I'm just coming from interview. He says, congratulations. I said, excuse me? He said, congratulations. <laughs> what? Is it? What is the congratulation about? He goes, oh, you got the job. Oh, Where wow. were you yesterday? I said, oh, I was interviewing Lusaka. He said, well, I'm saying congratulations. You got the job. Mm, what has good. happened is once I won the position, they put my picture and they advertised the, the email list mm. and the email list of African Union and yeah, the, the, members, the member states. Member states, the, yeah, because the, they are the rec, the re, uh, regional yeah, economic mm -hmm. community. It's part of the African Union. So he, as a high level, he saw it in his email. So he says, congratulations, he got the position. I was like, yeah. Uh, this is Mar good. On Martyr's Day, basically. On Martyr's Day, I found out that I got the position, but I was heading to Eritrea because I've yeah. done the interview. So as soon as I arrived in Eritrea, they called me back. They said, now, when will you be ready? Because he got the position, you got to come back and you'll be based in Malawi. So I come here and then uh, they buy me a ticket to Malawi. But it was a nice handover. And my predecessor was from Kenya. She was like a mother, really welcomed me, VIP style, you know? It was quite nice. They still have the colonize, uh, colonization structures from the British uh, empire about VIPs with the fancy cars and Madame this, Madame CEO that, you know? So it was quite, I'm still not used to it, you know? Everybody opening doors and bowing down. They don't look at you in the eye, you know? The whole thing that's not Eritrean, that's not American, you know? It's quite African and British. That's where mm. I am right now. Mm. It took me a while to be saying, Your Excellency, Your Honorable. I don't know what Honorable is and what Excellency, which position do you honor, which position do you Excellency? I, I didn't know all this. But I think that the, now the floor is part of that and you end up learning. So the word Mr. Miss is not used. Everything is Madame, it's, uh, it's position. If it's Secretary General, SG, if it's General Manager, GM, if it's CEO, CEO, your name is not quite... Uh, and so it's, it's, it was quite uh, an, an, an experience. And uh, plus this position is not just CEO, it's also a diplomatic position mm -hmm. because your country has to recommend you, you represent the country. So sometimes they call me Eritrea and, I'm, and I look around, they go, no, when they say Eritrea, it's you. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, really? <laughs> now I have a new name with my nation. So yeah, I'm proudly, yeah. you know, proudly mm -hmm. in this position as well. So 
sometimes they do get out of the mandate you have in your position as a CEO representing a women's association. They sometimes go off on things that is not true about your country, then they end up defending. And they defend it diplomatically, of course, but uh, it's quite amazing how distorted their mentalities about Eritrea. So I find myself constantly telling the good development programs we have, the, the, you know, the SDGs, we've, we've reached them, the free education, healthcare, access to clean water, the whole social justice uh, things that we implement in Eritrea, they're not knowledgeable. They don't even know it exists in Africa. Some of them, they tell me, can this be done in Africa? I said, yeah, can this be done without aid? Some of them tell me, how do you do this without aid? I'm like, what do you mean? We don't have aid. <laughs> you know, it's just like your people work, you organize your people, you get the job done. No, but our people don't work unless you pay them because this aid mentality has been there. They would not set foot even though it profits them. And business allows you to do things for yourself and benefit. No, but the business mentality is not there because the aid had killed it. So it's like a revival that has to come in Africa to just do my job. The mentality has to change and it's been generations. So for me to come and tell them, oh, you can do business for yourself without getting aid money, without getting paid to do your own business, they don't understand. So many businesses get got created with my predecessor and then they fell apart because as soon as, as long as she's giving them money from the programs, the business exists. The minute the program's money is done and think they're gonna be self-sustainable business, they fall apart and they shut down the business and they go home back to poverty. Amazing. So this is what's been happening. And I think now my job requires me to, to really address those issues where you teach, you, you empower, you sensitize, and then you guide. And then you support financially and also uh, technically, professionally support. Then uh, entrepreneurship is something we have to teach in Africa because Africa is an agricultural society and uh, getting an agricultural farmer who farms and feeds for sustainable farming into a profitable farm, it requires the entrepreneurship mind. So the entrepreneurial classes, the business classes, you have to arrange and teach, but you gotta also have a teachable and a willpower person. You can't just teach everyone and then this happens. It, it, it's, it's quite a long field, but I think the hope is number one, uh, COVID has allowed this um, <clears throat> to really be um, a platform, equal platform for women and youth. Um, because when COVID shut down, people had to feed themselves still because it shut us out from the rest of the world. Believe it or not, 80 to 90% of the food comes processed from outside, imported into Africa. So you produce it, they go for cheap, they take it, they process it and sell it to you 10 times more. That's what's happening now. So for this to, to, to get people out of this mentality, and now when COVID came and shut down our borders, there's no flights, there's no airplanes, there's no ships, as you remember. Mm -hmm. Then how do people feed themselves? Because there's nothing being imported, so the supermarkets are empty. Then Africa started looking within, because now we could share our borders and drive our products from one to one. At that point, we signed a tripartite agreement where from the SADA community, Southern African, the EAC and the COMESA, we opened our borders for, uh, what did we call it? Essential goods and services. So food, medicine, uh, and critical uh, items could be transported without um, having border uh, barriers. So we ease the barriers. We also created the yellow card scheme, which is you can have a, a license. Actually, Uganda started implementing the one license. So a driver can have one license throughout Africa without having to change different licenses driving different countries. Also the yellow card scheme gives you a political insurance instead of just economic insurance. Also, the political risk is in the insurance. So that if uh, you go pass through a country that has political unrest, they damage your car like what happened in South Africa. They burned a lot of the supply chain cars. Then you get reimbursed. So the business can continue going. So that kind of solutions are in Comesa. So it's, there's a lot of good things we're doing. Uh, however, the, the tripartite agreement in, 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 in implementation, it was impeded by the shortage of infrastructure. The roads are not quite there. They're flooded. You need bridges. You need you need a lot of things. Power, uh, power, power lines as well, and um, of course safety and security as well as you go through to do this integration. So all those are being worked, and uh, it's it exists. And uh, some member states they collaborate very well and they work with you. 
some member states are not active in this uh, in implementation. So COVID allowed, now we all were able to do virtual like what we're doing right now with you. So you can have meetings. In the past, you have to fly to their country to have a meeting with them. It's a very resource, uh, you know, you, you don't have much resources to do that, but time as well. And then how do you meet with four countries at the same time, right, mm -hmm. flying around, you couldn't do it. But now we have virtual and you can have all 21 countries in one virtual meeting. You harmonize your thoughts, your ideas, you can implement, and then they also can tell you what they could do. So this, this COVID thing has been a, a blessing in disguise. The other aspect of it on the grassroots level is also women uh, started when they, for example, the teachers, when they lost their job or schools got closed because of COVID, they started looking within in, in their backyard, in the fields, they started growing food. Now they, you know, when the restaurants close, they start cooking in their home kitchen and using their, their son's husbands and driving around and delivering food home, home like Uber. So an Uber, an informal Uber got created, which was quite amazing. So now people are making it different and new value chains are opening up. And then the young people that didn't have a job now have a job transporting food. So actually, we haven't stopped. A lot of my uh, women who are doing farming, they are now delivering fresh food from their farm to my house. And I don't have to go to the grocery store for vegetables and, and meats and fruits anymore because it comes delivered to my house fresh from their garden. It's cheap. It's also for them. It's making them more money than they did before. So solutions like that. And then um, things like um, financial systems, going to the bank. Now, when COVID came, the banks were closed. You couldn't access your money. You couldn't go to the bank. Now there's banking and the, uh, and the phone system, the Airtel, the phone companies start creating uh, cash um, cash um, driven like accounts. So now people are using, even people who didn't have bank accounts before are using this uh, Airtel money or this uh, phone money, uh, financial uh, systems. So that allows now people to, uh, to do more business because now you have access to each other's cash without the safety security risks because the, you know it's all uh, digital money. Wow. So, man, I, I can't even tell you how many good things are happening in Africa because of COVID, but this has created a whole new way of doing business. We are now in a different platform. I don't think we'll ever go back because mm. life has become a lot more simpler than it was before. You raised a couple of uh, good first, uh, issues. Uh, one of them is about self-sufficiency and the other one is about entrepreneur. But uh, So we start with self-sufficiency uh, because you mentioned in the... Uh, in your uh, interview that you had asked about uh, you know, self-sufficiency and, and stuff like that. So, and some of the criticism about a AU, African Union and others is that their, their budget is subsidized by some, somebody else and so forth. So uh, is, how, is your organization or COMESA, is it self-sufficient for, like, for the projects that uh, um, you're doing? And uh, we'll go to the second one, which is about entrepreneurship because we, when we talk about entrepreneurship, for example, in the West, is the idea of creating something new, uh, an entrepreneurship. But you cannot necessarily implement that in, in Africa because uh, a process that you, you work on, I mean, all these different things that, that you see in, uh, in auto shops and uh, even the women selling the stuff on the streets and, and so forth, they... Um, their marketing, they have their own marketing, business, you know, system, they have their own. So all of that, in, for, for example, by the measurement of the West, will not be entrepreneurship. But I think it should be entrepreneurship because of any process you're doing in marketing, in organization, in, uh, changing the way you used to and come up with uh, innovative ways of support. Uh, is so how, how do you measure that when uh, about the women Women in businesses. I mean, uh, how how do you look into that? What what's your opinion about that? So two part questions. First question and answer is short. Uh, Comesa is um, ninety percent partner funded and ten percent uh, member states fund. So the twenty one member states constitute about ten or eleven percent of our budget. Uh, the remaining eighty nine ninety percent is done by partner budgets. They come as a project. Um, then we implement the project according to the work plans. So that's the answer to that. Um, in the future, right now with our Secretary General, she's really mobilizing to make it dependent uh, 
uh, or member state funded or like self-sufficient type of organization uh, because it's, it's driven by the policies of the member states. The member states have to agree to make it an independent. Um, they have to agree the policy should be uh, sponsored. So uh, there is a movement now where member states have to pick up and implement and become partners in implementing these policies in their country within their national development plan. And Eritrea has already uh, advanced in this kind of agenda because really when I see the COMESA agenda, it's really the national development agenda with Eritrea. It aligns very nicely. We're already doing what we're doing. So it just complements and works. So I would say, I wanted to add here, uh, we just established our uh, Comesa Federation of Women in Business and, and Asmara last July under Ministry of Agriculture. So now our women, uh, we're going to be focused on value addition of uh, agricultural products. So I think this one will have another uh, session to elaborate more on that in another day, but it's quite exciting and uh, when I arrived, there were only four countries taking advantage of my institution. Now we have reached all 20 countries, except for Ethiopia. Understandably, with the situation they're in, they told me once the settles will establish the institution. So we will wait for them to call us to establish it. But all the other countries, the 20 countries have established. So we, we went one by one. The, the member states, uh, heads of state, have been working with a lot of presidents, ministers, helping out to establish our institution. So the idea of establishing this chapter in the countries is to really make it self-reliant so that the women become part and, parts, uh, part and parcel of the national development plan. Because really, if it's agriculture, it's trade, it's industry, every country should have that plan. So we have incubation centers, we have uh, clusters where women can come and learn uh, entrepreneurship, also technical and, and receive uh, technical skills, how to process and receive uh, factories, a small, a small uh, processing plants, so that they process the goods and uh, brand it, package it, brand it, and market it. So that we are creating our own value added products in Africa. That makes you the self-reliant or independent uh, uh, institution. So we're working towards that. How do we see entrepreneurship of African women? They are more than entrepreneur, because if you think of business being uh, the economic uh, driver of societies and communities, it's really done by the micro, small, and medium enterprises of women activities. You're correct when you say the women who are selling the food stands on the, on the, on the you know, tomatoes, potatoes, whatever else they sell in the streets. They are feeding the community at a very reasonable cost. In, in essence, if there's a supermarket, the, 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 whoever owns the supermarket will have to pay rent and have to hire employees. The cost is going to be a lot. The overhead cost is included into the, the things that we buy. So, and also he has to have insurance and other things. So this will cost you more. Plus uh, the women, since they are in the community, the community gets easy access to fresh products. Uh, so that also helps the, the health uh, and, the, and the nutrition of the area, depending on what's available there. And then I've noticed also women, they, they grow food based on the needs of the people. If they want cassava, that's what they're growing. So within an acre field, you see a variety of uh, things in, in here, for example, in Malawi, even in Eritrea, you see, you know, vegetables like, you know, hamli, peppers and tomatoes and, you know, and then in Malawi you have cassava, avocado, this, this. Within that small acre that they have, they like five, six, 10 different uh, varieties of things are there. At the same time, they're growing chicken and eggs. And then on the other side, there's goats and, and sheep. So, and they have honey, uh, they have bee, honey bees. They do everything. And it's quite amazing. You know, then you like, you have the whole supermarket growing in one acre field. <laughs> so are they entrepreneurial? Oh yes, they definitely are. Cause they're, you know, they're looking at the market, the needs and they're supplying what the market wants, but it's not formal by any sense. It's not mm -hmm. formalized. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's hard to measure the success of it because they are informal mm -hmm. businesses. Right. Also there's sustainable farming. So there's no profits that go to the bank. Whatever money comes there goes back to feeding their family, taking care of it, and then sustaining the little business that they have. So yeah, so that's the whole idea of uh, a value addition. Now, I think if we go into value addition, there will be a chain of uh, value chain created where producers, processors, and then clients and customers could be, uh, the whole logistics of it could be implanted. Then you could say, yes, there's an entrepreneurship here. 
but an African entrepreneurship is totally defined differently mm -hmm. than the, uh, the Western, uh, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you look at it, both entrepreneurship uh, ideologies feed the national uh, economy, feed mm -hmm. the people. So yeah, they, mm -hmm. they, they're different, but they are definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It works. It works for the societies that they're in. Especially Africa has a, more, a lot more informal economy than formal economy. So how do you utilize that? How do you harness that and then create more uh, value added to what you're saying? Mm -hmm. When we think this formalized versus non-formalized uh, uh, businesses, I think what's different is the fact that the formalized businesses pay taxes and help the governments establish the kind of infrastructures that the society will need, mm -hmm. hence developing the nation. Mm -hmm. In the informal businesses, there's no way they pay taxes, there's no structure. So how do the governments become mm -hmm. self-sustainable? How mm -hmm. do the government structure and give the kind of like, and now that I see, I, I want to push the women from being informal to formal businesses, mm -hmm. but then you have to build the, the supermarket. Where does the money is gonna come? We need power. Mm -hmm. They're selling fresh chicken right now, live chicken like this but I'm gonna process the chicken, then the ha there's going to be electricity needed because mm. you can't keep chicken more than what, a couple of hours before salmonella poisoning comes. So you got the, the governments have to be ready with power. Mm. So there's enough power, then you can store the chicken and have processed goods uh, for a long time and you know can have value chain. So mm. I think that's where the Africa challenge is right now. For us to be sustainable, we need infrastructure and energy. Mm -hmm. For that to be created, you need some kind of flow of uh, flow of taxes or flow of currency that comes in into the government from the activity of its own people. Mm -hmm. And for that, you know, it's like it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. But if we someone figure it out and invest in that infrastructure and energy and create that, and if you notice what Eritrea is doing right now, the roads are being built, the lifeline roads that go from the port to the border of Ethiopia, from the port to the, to the border of Sudan because those are the lifelines mm -hmm. that will create some kind of a value chain logistics because we can take advantage of our port services. Mm -hmm. That will go then into giving us uh, more currency to develop our uh, infrastructure, also further energy. So once we have energy, then we'll be able to sustain, uh, build uh, you know, supermarkets and, um, mm -hmm. and provide uh, sustainable energy. So then factories and things can be, value addition factories could be created or the ones that are there exist like <clears throat> to be able to support at the same time formal businesses will come then there will be a flow of taxes and other other mm -hmm. fees that will sustain the services of the so that's i think that's that's where we are in africa for us mm -hmm. to get out of this informal business into formal you need that and of course the financial services but the financial services i think through technology <laughs> mm -hmm. in the past you needed a bank you have mm -hmm. to have a bank everywhere. Women have to be financial literacy literate to be able to open mm -hmm. an account and use it. And uh, and through that, you have some fees where you can really manage and, and, and measure the business. Yes, is a sustainable real commercial or is a sustainable uh, uh, businesses. But I think um, in the verge of that, we are learning. In, in, in learning, I think the linkages will come and then the linkages will create clusters. The clusters will unite. And then across Africa, we'll be able to uh, like reciprocally support each other and, and, and have um, some kind of a reciprocity where I, miss, I don't have olive oil, then Tunisia uh, you know, exports their olive oil to, to Eritrea. And Eritrea has um, oranges and mangoes and Tunisia needs mangoes, it doesn't grow there. So Eritrea can ex export dried mangoes, mango juice, uh, fresh mangoes there. And it's just such a, but there has to be a flight from Eritrea to Tunisia somehow, much faster than going to Europe and other places that exist now. So that value chain creates that integration by having just simple things to start with logistics like that. Um, uh, another thing that we're addressing is as a, as a cross-cutting socioeconomic issues, which uh, safety and security, human rights, employment, um, environment, um, the whole, the whole gender issue, policies and plans and strategies are implement, are actually united to create this kind of a activity where we are moving towards one united and harmonized policies that are conducive to our people. Because Africa is so diverse, our also is our policies are that diverse. So then how do you integrate economies when you have diverse policies and cultures and traditions and diverse foods? Cassava, we don't know cassava in Eritrea. I learned it when it came here. 
But now I'm realizing the cassava powder is such is so easily uh, created that uh, in Eritrea we need the flour to make bread for the bakeries. So banakh gabersi, you need you need you know flour, and the flour is could easily be harvested from cassava. But Eritrea doesn't know cassava. So introducing these kind of things there will be able to you know eliminate the imports that we're having, or not eliminate but replace the imports uh, in in healthy foods. And it's and cassava is a gluten free food. So imagine having bunny with gluten free. Well, there's going to be a lot of healthy people <laughs> eating this kind of bunny, you know, but it's delicious. You can bake goods and do many things with cassava. And so, by the way, the pancake mix that you eat in America, that's cassava. It's made out oh, of pancake. Really? Oh, okay. cassava, yeah, it's yeah. pancake. But they don't tell you it's cassava. They just uh, tell you pancake mix, you know. <laughs> yeah, but they yeah. add water, you only add water and you make a pancake that's made out of cassava. And of course, they mix other things. So um, and, and imagine it costs 50 cents per kg. One mm -hmm. kilo is 50 cents here in, in Malawi. When you buy that for one kg in Costco, it's $10. So imagine the, the profit margin between 10, 50 cents and uh, $10. Yeah. It's just processing it, packaging it, and you got $10 out of the 50 cents kg. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of profit margin that will bring our people to a lot. So mm -hmm. this harmonizes then it really goes through the cross-cutting issues that we're facing. And when women are economically empowered, then they're also taking care of the abuse they might have been facing at home because you know the husband couldn't supply them. Or there are issues of AIDS, there's uh, issues of uh, uh, what you call it, malaria and other things. So it's it's it really is um, economic empowerment is really uh, the, the grassroots of a lot of uh, uh, society's problems in Africa. Could be solved because women are economically empowered. Lack of education of a woman does a nice business and is in economically empowered. She can take care of her children, send them to school. She can, uh, you know, when they get sick, she can afford to take, uh, take care of them and their health. And uh, the husband, when she he knows she's bringing money, is being well fed, there's not much of uh, family problems and abuse. Uh, you can just go on, even the girl education. Once there's money the mother is bringing, she can afford to pay for her daughter to go to school. And the daughter can go to school because she doesn't have to carry water because mom can pay for somebody to bring her water to the house, you know? So it just really encompasses a lot more. So with this understanding, we've been doing a lot of mobilization. I want to kind of end it in a, the, the trade fair that you just had in September. So could you tell us about that? What was it about and how is that the first time? Is it how often the, does that happen? How did how do people participate in it? Uh, um, uh, that kind of stuff. First trade fair was 2020 when COVID lockdown happened. Uh, I uh, we thought about we said you know we're locked down but women are not locked down. So as long as there's air that opens up, women will fly to meet with each other and link so that they can start waking up the, the economies in their country. So we tried it and uh, it took me about six months, seven months of asking the COVID team in Malawi if they can host a trade fair. And we asked the first lady of Malawi to raise the event. She agreed and Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Health, the Kobe team, they permitted us in end of October um, to do this trade fair for November. And that's when the COVID, uh, uh, what do you call it, the COVID prevalences were going down. So we said, oh my God, how do you prepare for a trade fair for all these women to come from all these member states within three weeks. It could not happen, but women quite amazingly are resilient and African women are double resilient. So <laughs> I was so amazed. So we said, all right, let's make it happen. When, okay, first week of uh, December, let's make it happen. Then we advertised, we organized and women start organizing their travel visas, this, that, and the COVID of course, more than travel visas now, the difficult things is COVID certificates. Oh my goodness, the rules, the regulations, the cost that comes with it. $100 just for one certificate. And then you go to other country to exit another $100, $200 just of a, of a COVID certificate. And then the visa, another 50 here, 50 there. And then of course the flight, the accommodation. So how do you do business when you're spending all your profits on COVID certificates and uh, accommodations and flights? So, but these women, they really wanted to come and they wanted to link, and they wanted to see what could they offer each other across their countries? So they came, they came, we hosted 10 countries in Malawi last year in 2020. And we discussed 
We had very nice workshops. We also linked with the Bankers Association of Malawi. And uh, we had very good um, enlightenment where we told the banks they have to work for their own people. They can't just be looking after their profits. They have to create financial facilities to really alleviate the, 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 the businesses to be able to do uh, grow, like, you know, merging and growing. You, you have to have facilities that meet the MSMEs because right now the banks are only working for the rich companies in Africa. The SMEs, no, the banks don't give them any loans. They don't, they say, oh, it's a high risk business. They don't give them any kind of credits. So how do you grow your business when you don't have that kind of support? So we had very good discussions and the trade fair ended very well. Then they, then Zambia said, next year we're hosting it in Zambia. So that's how we ended up in this trade. It was hosted in, in Zambia. We planned nine months, everything was prepared. And as the trade fair was being prepared, I have this monthly set informational sessions, I think you participated in one of them, where yeah. we bring in other commission institutions, partnerships, where they present their information to our women and our women prepare themselves to take advantage of those things. So during those sessions, they, a lot of knowledge is coming. When women know, they implement immediately. It's amazing. So all of them were excited. So they decided to come to, to Zambia. Um, the surprising visits this year uh, that we didn't have in Malawi the year before was the uh, presence of Eritrea, presence of Somalia, presence of Libya. And these three countries uh, and seashells, they, they, nobody expected them and they showed up. So the others, they've been coming for all the trade fair, but these four countries didn't participate before. So existence of them not only coming, but they were also sponsored by their governments, which is something new in Comesa. If you're gonna do any activity, you have to pay for people to come to you. But this activity, the member states paid for them. For example, Eritrean women, um, two were sponsored from, by Ministry of Fisheries, two were sponsored by Ministry of Agriculture, one was sponsored by Hamade, by Women's Association, and one was my chair, which was sponsored throughout office. So six women came representing their sectors, and they brought all the products from their sectors and they displayed, they sold, they linked. It was a wonderful activity. Somalis, the same thing, six women came. Djibouti was the other one that nobody expected. So this Horn of African countries, people didn't expect them to come because they have never participated before from a since history of Comesa as women. Uh, and so so they, them showing up their products, believe it or not. So we had a word ceremony. The Women Entrepreneur of the Year was Somali. The best exhibitor of uh, uh, the best exhibitor woman was Libya, which is the awards were taken, you know. Of mm -hmm. course, then we had to have one for Zambia since they hosted the best Zambian entrepreneurship. And then the best chapter uh, award went to Eswatini. Mm -hmm. Eswatini chapter chair, she's an honorable uh, parliament member. And as a parliament member, she used her position by the empowerment we gave her to mobilize in all the regions of her country to bring the women into doing things for themselves. Because Eswatini in the heart of South Africa, they face a lot of economic hardships. So she really mobilized the women and they to do their textile factories, to wake up um, the farming uh, value addition, but also for tourism, arts and crafts, and the chicken abattoir. So mm -hmm. there's a chicken processing plant that women own as a property now. So we gave her the award very happily. And she was shocked. It's amazing, you know, and these women I'm talking about, they're in their 60s and 70s. They've been trying to drive this women empowerment agenda for almost all their life. So coming to the trade fair and seeing their presentation and representing their countries, holding their flag during the flag ceremony. I can not tell you, I'm just so delighted. Then the commissioner of African Union uh, came uh, for mining and industry, came from Addis Ababa with his seven people delegation to come and grace our event, which was big deal. Mm -hmm. And um, so he said, if Africa is going to be um, freed, it's going to be through uh, economically freed, it's going to be through women's activity. The Zambia, quite amazingly, we did that. And also there's an e-commerce platform called Sokuku. Sokuku means marketplace. Mm -hmm. It's a Swahili word. And uh, we launched Sokuku with a partnership called AE Trade Group, the African Electronic Group. Uh, they're located in Canada but they're opening headquarters in, in Rwanda, Igali, Rwanda. So the president of Kagame allowed for that. And uh, we'll be able to use that platform to do e-commerce uh, of, of all these businesses for trade integration, but also the logistics and uh, the ICT will be hosted through Sokuku. 
So that was launched during our trade fair. Then we had gala night. And uh, so the minister of trade came and he made very nice speech. And our women mobilized and advocated for a land to build the headquarters of Zambian Women Association in Zambia. During that trade fair, the minister promised to give them land, which was a big deal. So we are receiving a land to do headquarters for uh, Zambian Women Association, not for Comesa, but for Zambia as a nation. So we'll be building a, a, a Comesa Women business there for incubation centers to do training and also to, to, to do the efforts there. So it was uh, quite a successful uh, trade fair. Women exhibited their products. They linked with each other. And um, out of 20 member states, 15 attended in person. And then the other five attended virtually due to COVID restrictions, uh, transport, the costs to come from, for example, to come from Madagascar to Zambia. They had to go from Madagascar, Paris, Paris, back to Addis, and then to Zambia. And the trade co cost was from, uh, like normally it would cost 800 to $1,000. This time it was going to cost them 4400 for one ticket. There is no way they can participate. Mm -hmm. So Africa needs to come up with a solution where you can fly from Madagascar to Zambia. It's really a four hour flight that ended up being a three day flight with that much cost. Why? Because Madagascar doesn't have any flights now going there, only Air France. So if Air France is going to take you, they want to make sure you go to Paris and come back. We couldn't have that kind of flight. So we ended up the 15 countries that came, we hosted them. And also side by side, we had workshops and seminars where uh, banks, uh, women's banks came uh, or women's uh, bank, bank institutions that have facilities for women businesses. They did. Uh, their financial literacy, they presented the services, and a lot of uh, communication happened where women were, you know, voicing their grievances about how banks are not serving them. And the banks went with the realization that, yeah, it's time. If you do not serve the women SMEs, you're going to go bankrupt because women are not being served. They're going to be creating their own banking systems through phone and the tablets, and it's going to be a virtual banking. So the real banks right now, that as, as they exist, are not going to be existing in the future. So there was a lot of discussions and the banks had left with a good realization. So that trade fair was quite amazing. Then, of course, we had gala night and fashion show, the whole nine yard of excitement where we danced. And uh, it was my birthday as well. So they celebrated oh. my birthday. <laughs> so that, that's the trade fair. It was yeah. very successful. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you so much. Because... Uh... Like you mentioned, I, you invited me to be in one. Of the, so the organization was very, I was impressed. And that's the first time I, I heard you. They were calling you Mad, Madame CEO. <laughs> so <laughs> Madame CEO, uh, I keep, yeah, I keep Madame hearing Ma, CEO. Madame CEO. And then I'm like, are they calling Ruth Madame CEO? <laughs> My name, I haven't heard it in two years. I know, I know. I, was, but, I, don't, uh, I haven't heard Ruth for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I have to get used to it because, you know, they're like, every time it's like, Madame CEO, Madame, okay. So, but the, 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 the organization was, the, I was very impressed. Uh, they, we they presented the ideas. Uh, I was very impressive. So um, thank you for inviting me for that. Um, so it was, it was very nice. Uh, so I can see how, you know, all the other events that you mentioned, it's like well taken care of because the organization, I don't uh, the discipline and all that was very, very impressive. Uh, so again, and then also, you know, in that meeting, they were from, by Zooms, they were, they were from Egypt, from the, all over the country, you know, different countries. So I think it's, uh, I think there's no turning back now with uh, Zoom and all that, with virtual meeting and, you know, and stuff like that. So, but, I mean, you brought a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I'm glad you also mentioned about the informal formal, which is very important. And how do you change uh, informal to formal because formal is like you said the taxes and so forth that's the only way the government governments could do structures and so forth it's through taxes and stuff like that so if there's no taxes then uh, where's the government going to get the, the income and all that but so again how do you change it that, that's a challenge for African countries but how do you use can you use culture for example to uh, that that are done informally and change it to form, for example. There are things like, I know in Africa, there are other places, uh, they might call it different names, but the idea is the same, for example, what they call a coop. You know, how do we, can we transform a coop into a financial, you know, organizing that system, create, 
create, uh, you know, like uh, credit unions and stuff like that? Can culture be, you know, like uh, in Ethiopia, they have what they call things like that, you know? So can you go into the culture and bring out so that it could be used as financial? Because women were creative about this. And, uh, and the other things are basically started by, uh, by women where with the limited amount of money that they have, they will contribute, they create a pool and out of that pool, it rotates. So, I mean, it's a cultural uh, you know, in, in innovation of women, but can we use that and create it into a formal financial you know, system where it could be that? So can culture be uh, one of them? And the second thing is that how, how the role of diaspora, for example, as you know, the uh, Hamad in this country, uh, you know, for example, different women associations go and build, uh, you know, hubs or centers or uh, incubators for women to start. For example, I know they're like in San Afe, there's a women's uh, cult, uh, entrepreneur incubator that they created. There is in Mandafa and then different places. So. Uh, is there a way where the member states uh, there? I know that in Africa, there are a lot of people in the diaspora. So can that be implemented or used as an example uh, uh, like that? And then lastly, the, so there are 21 COMESA members uh, from the East Africa and Southern Africa. Are there countries that are not in, in that group and why are they not in COMESA or in, for example, in Mozambique there, South Sudan, I mean, this part of, yeah. So is there a plan to add to those kind of countries or is there a reason why they didn't join? It's quite exciting that you've captured uh, things that are authentically being uh, implemented without formalized uh, uh, recognition. Let me just say that because their culture plays a big deal in the economy and economies are, are really doing well because the cultural aspects of uh, the actual activities are influencing them. So with the, let me go with the women. Uh, so what they call it is VLS, which is Village Lending Services. And this is the Urkub. So Eritrea, we call it Urkub. Here in Malawi, they call it Banki Konde. In, um, in, in Kenya, there is a name for it. In Sudan, they call it Sanduk. In Egypt, the same thing. Libya, they call it Sanduk. So the whole Africa, all 21 member states, women do Urkub. So then that's how they've been running their businesses. So now taking that into a banking service, they've already done that. In Zimbabwe, through that, during COVID, they created what they call Women Empowered Excel Banks. It's a women's sacco bank. So what women have done is 700 women came together and donated $1,000 each. So 700 times 1,000, you do the math, it's big mm -hmm. enough money to help you create a bank. So they created the bank, hired the CEO. The CEO started mobilizing this. Women start lending against the money they put forth with a, sh with a small interest rate. And uh, virtually, this is taking place now. <laughs> so once the, they started working, the government even allowed them to use a hard currency. So that was the first bank in Zimbabwe that was allowed to give you in cash. So if somebody from Malawi sends money to Zimbabwe, um, Previously, you could only get it in Zimbabwean francs. But now, or is it dollar? I think it's Zimbabwean dollar. But now we can get a US dollar out of that bank because they've strengthened themselves to the point where the services are backing up their, their cash flow. Then Malawi uh, have been uh, also uh, creating a women's bank. They call it, it's a, it's a microfinance here. Uh, through this banking conde, it went from uh, a small uh, group like thing into a formalized women uh, investment cooperative, which they call it WINCO. So they are now, they want to be a big bank as well, but in Malawi, the policy is in order to be, open a bank, you must show um, $10 million, which they don't have. So they cannot be called a bank, but they are a microfinancier and women can lend. So for every, and the, the, so there's a new, it says share based. So. If you put in $50, you can borrow $150 out. Uh, it's like three times more you can borrow for the money that you put as a share. And the interest rate is very cheap. Uh, I think it's like six to 10%, which is, the banks is about 23 to 33 or even 35% interest. 
but with this window, it's uh, under 10 under 10. So women could really uh, grow their businesses uh, by lending against their own shares. Plus, their shareholders at the end of the year will get the shares back. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of getting the shares back, last year what they decided to do is invest it into real estate. So they are buying homes, renting the homes, uh, also building shops, renting the shops, and making money from it. So they're diversifying their uh, their shares instead of just sitting in a in a bank like thing waiting for people to borrow from it. They are now investing it into real estate. And actually, Zimbabweans are also doing the same thing. Uh, we have another. Women's Bank in Burundi. We also have Innat Bank in Ethiopia. Innat Bank has been there for a long time. Innat Bank is owned by, it started by 11 women opening it. And then now it's become a very big bank. It actually competes with Abyssinia Bank and all the other national banks that are there. And the owners, the shareholders are 51% women, 49% more. And they have about 18,000 to about 25,000 people that are uh, we, you know, bank people that bank, but it's across the whole Ethiopia. So I met the CEO last time because we're trying to see where are the women's bank or women friendly banks that can really help the SMEs, and then how could we utilize them to do the trade integration across our chapters or across the MISA memberships in our states? Um, because when you think trade, number one is bank, banking system. How do I handle my money? Where is it going, and how is it coming, and how how safe and insured is it? So that's one aspect of it. And the second is logistics. Who's gonna get my products there and how is it safely going to arrive? Well, I, and then if it's not good enough when it comes back, where is the system to bring it back? Insurance for it and all that. And is it going to be air freighted? Is it gonna be driven or is it gonna be for ships? Because we do share a lot of water bodies across the continent, whether it's the internal lake, like Lake Malawi, Lake Victoria, we, or like the Nile River, or is it going to be the, the oceans, the Indian Ocean, the seas of Red Sea and others, so Mediterranean Sea. So these, these are the vessels that we're looking into. And right now we're working with Ethiopian Airlines and uh, Rwanda Air, Air Rwanda um, and DHL. And DHL is quite expensive, but they have very fantastic structures that work across the continent. So we met with the CEO last time and uh, um, we just want to learn the systems from them, then different value chain of like DHL like that. Could do it, come in in the future. But right now we don't have that since DHL is the only thing we have on the continent. Let's let's merge with them and start something that uh, establish logistics for them. So these other services that we says into, along with the yellow card scheme that I told you earlier, drivers harmonizing their licenses and insurance systems like that. But we do have the insurance system where if women want to go to another state and start their business, they can insure it for political risks. So like recently, there was an uproar uh, in, in Swatini, as you saw, South Africa, Swatini. They, the people burned the informal businesses. So when you have a small little shop made out of a small container, they burn it, you have nothing because you don't have insurance. So then you go to nothing, like completely lose out. And there's no one to lend you to restart that business. So we've started in, in, in Comfrey, uh, COVID revolving fund, or we call it emergency revolving fund. So if you have emergencies like that, you could you could take money away from us and then pay back with the three to seven percent uh, interest. Debt. So they've they've already been tapping into it where you know they just borrow hundred five hundred dollars. That's yeah. that's really what informal mm -hmm. businesses are. But they return it back within six months. It's amazing. We've had hundred percent return back of the women that have been utilizing this just mm -hmm. in the last year and a half. So these kind of services are also there available for them. Mm, as far as uh, the second one, we have been discussing it because I've been receiving a lot of friends, family, every time that we communicate about these value addition activities. Mm -hmm. um, in Eritrea, our chapter is looking into creating an incubator. Now, the incubator, the Ministry of Agriculture is providing the place, but we're going to need equipment. Mm -hmm. Once the equipment comes, it will be training the women. So maybe at the beginning, it might be a grant. But we're trying to stay away from grants because grants, they supply you and then it's good for startup business. But the best part is the investments. So we would like to attract the diaspora to invest into this kind of businesses because if you invest, if you invest in this incubation programs or clusters, then once they start making money, your money is working for you. So we will be inviting you. The, the portfolio is not done yet, as I uh, told you before about that. We just launched the Sokoku. 
So there will be a financial, it's an online uh, financial system. Through that, we'll create an investment for these kind of activities. Through that, we'll be able to um, now let you know where are the business plans of the different women uh, uh, initiatives. There's a lot of cooperatives and association. The other thing about Comissa is we don't work with individual women. We work with associations, cooperatives, and organizations because we believe we should influence a whole lot of part of the society instead of just one woman to become rich. So these incubators, it teaches them, 30 women will come, they will learn uh, theoretically about entrepreneurship, financial literacy and trade. Then they go out and bring their uh, into the factory. They learn how to process their goods. So if she was growing tomatoes, she comes with the tomatoes as a tomato making uh, a machine. Then she processes it, she packages it, and then she goes and sells and you know, package and brand with her own business name. And then she markets and makes profit. And then she keeps continuing to grow. Then another woman who grows tomatoes could be doing the same thing. Then eventually they become a cluster. So what we do is we don't only teach them uh, to process, but also standardize it, quality. And so it can have a, a higher shelf life. So it could be sold to big supermarkets or it could be exported out to other states. And um, once they do this, then they're able to come together and have quantity. Because see, the other thing about traders, you can't just trade a bucket. You gotta trade a container. So if a woman farmer by herself, she cannot, but when, how, how, what kind of field is she going to be uh, doing to be able to fill up a container? But if a bunch of farmers who own all this land come, they're doing the same thing, then you have the quantity. Our job will be an incubator, teaching them the standards, and also to be able to package similarly with similar uh, branding so that um, there is a brand that you know it's going to be a good quality and that you can trust that product. Then that way you build your customer base, then you're ready for export uh, or you're ready to import that product because you know you can trust it. So in Comesa, we have SPSS, the sanitary, phytosanitary standards. They come and they train them and they organize on how these women can, can go uh, along with uh, preparing their businesses and agriculture for uh, exports. Now I can give you one example that's positively that happened recently. The Zimbabwe government gave our cooperative women a hundred hectares of land for them to do such activity. Mm -hmm. Hundred hectares, that's a lot of land. Mm -hmm. So the women, about 400 of them, they were, they're farmers. They're prepared to use this land, but what we're helping them is they didn't know what product now mm -hmm. are going to use that land with, so they're able to make profit out of this. So Comesa, one of the things we deal with is, is cassava. But the women have not planted cassava. They only do maize, maize and, uh, and, and also groundnuts, which is peanuts. So but groundnuts and peanuts and maize, everybody does it. There's no market for it. Mm -hmm. But cassava, there's international, uh, what is it, $1.3 million, is it billion dollar? It's a big, uh, you know, it's a big market out there for them. So we are now um, working into hiring a consultant to guide them, to teach them, also to look for the best seeds of cassava. Where is it found? Believe it or not, it's found here in Malawi. The Malawi cassava is the best seed. So now we are sending the seed, but there's a seed harmonization policy in Comisa as well, because you can't just move seed from state to state without certification. Yeah. So you certify that seed and then we link up with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Trade of Zimbabwe. They export the seed from Malawi to Zimbabwe. Then they start preparing their land. Cassava doesn't like rain. So you cannot plant it during high rainy season. It's gotta be during the dry season when the season is ending. So November, December, then by January, February, start planting cassava because it's a dry. So it's perfect for Eritrea where you don't have enough uh, waterfall. Cassava can grow very happily here. Because they rain so much, what they do is they, they pick up the soil and create this kind of mounds of small little hills. Then they, go, they, they plant the cassava on the hills. Then the water can go on the, on on the, the, on the, on the plants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, this way, uh, it takes about, what, six months to nine months to, to mature up for potatoes to grow wet. So we have to teach them the seasons, how to plant, what to do, da, da, da. And then once this hectares, so they've decided 50 hectares, they'll be able to plant it. Now, what do we do with 50 hectares of potatoes or cassavas? <laughs> you have to have a processing plant of some sort to process it, make a powder, 
package it and be able to export. But it's good enough quantity and the seeds will be there. So in a good enough quality. And now we have to teach them with the Zimbabwean uh, standards units. So they could teach them how to standardize the product, also test it and certify it before it could be packaged and exported. So I'm learning a lot. Again, just like I learned in, Mal in, in Bisha. Bisha I was all like doing the modules, approving the modules. As a manager, uh -huh. I had to approve every class module. I learned a lot because I read all the modules here and mm -hmm. I mean, that's the same thing there to do the programs and to do, go through these experiences with the women. I had to learn policies. I have to learn mm -hmm. how to do standards and uh, the trade integration, the barriers. Of course, there's also gender issues, which I don't want to go in details yeah. on it because mm -hmm. it's part of life. There's yeah. always going to be discrimination, always going to be barriers, always going to be somebody trying to do something negative or mm -hmm. go against you. It just has to make you strong so that when they come against you, either go above them or you influence them to become part of you or you go around them and continue life because mm -hmm. that's just how it is. So we don't focus on the barriers, but we focus on managing the barriers and how do we advance. But we also work with the high Yeah, like advocacy groups. We work with the government officials. That's the beauty of COMESA. This job, you have access to the high level officials where you influence policy and advocate for the right kind of policies, but you also are on the grassroots level with the people implementing and also guiding, supporting, coordinating, and empowering them so that they, they can do their job towards progress mm -hmm. and also have a common vision so that at some point we will have make a difference in our economies and we will support a better life and livelihoods of our communities. So, mm -hmm. And of course, they create a lot of jobs as well, the yeah. unemployment. Mm -hmm. So the mentality now is after COVID, people are not thinking to immigrate out to go get a job in, in Western countries. People are thinking we need security and safety. That's all they're expecting from the government is safety and security. Please have a peaceful uh, you know, uh, life for us. We're going to raise up our economy ourselves. And the young people, they're saying, hey, our, our, you know, we're going to create jobs for ourselves. So just create the conducive environment for us. Allow us to buy, you know, open up shop to, to rent this, give us a business license, you know, just allow us, just create a platform for us because we create our own jobs. Earlier you asked me which countries are not from southern, southern, northern, which countries are not in it. Uh, because it's tripartite, we have the EAC, all eight countries, into Comesa and overlapping. The only country that doesn't overlap is Tanzania. So Tanzania is not in Comesa, but it's an EAC. So mm -hmm. through tripartite, we end up doing programs mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And then in the southern region, the Mozambique, the Botswana, all of the Namibia, South Africa, they're in the SADC community, mm -hmm. the southern Africa. And there's 14 countries. And eight out of the 14 overlap from Esa. Uh -huh. All the in the ocean country, all four of them. And then the four, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Eswatini, they overlap with the mm -hmm. SADC. So they're SADC, they're also from Esa. So, you know, the tripartite really allows the whole, almost mm. half of Africa as 28 countries, which is more than half, to, to be integrated and work together. We also have our sisters with ECOWAS. ECOWAS is 14 countries yeah. of Western Africa. Mm -hmm. We also have them in a, the 50 million African women's platform. We have mm -hmm. a platform where we do mentorship, linkages. It's a, a womenconnect.com, uh, womenconnect.org. Mm -hmm. I think it's womenconnect.org. There's an app as well. And we connect with them for advisory. We use them, and there is a lot of uh, information sharing across those uh, three RECs, which is ECOWAS, EAC, and COMESA. So mm -hmm. there's also that for women. And there's a tripartite as well as other states. So I think I answered all your questions. Now. Yeah, no, you did. You did actually. I was uh, impressive, <laughs> Madam CEO. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Isha. yeah. No, it was very impressive. I mean, I know. Um, you know, time is always a problem, but I think uh, after coming back from Durban and uh, later with the incubator program that you started in Eritrea, I'm sure we're going to ask you to come back again and uh, talk to us. Uh, but again, uh, we raised a whole lot of uh, issues and stuff like that that are very pertinent, not only to Eritrea, but to Africa and also to to people in the diaspora. I mean, there are if there are people who want to do uh, research, for example, or women entrepreneurship to, to write PhDs and stuff like that, they can come and contact you. And, uh, and I mean, it, it could be a big data database and also entrepreneur uh, internship for people who wanted to study this. I think, uh, you know, the link with the diaspora is also very important. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I know there are a lot of women who are, uh, you know, 
in fashion who are creating amazing fashion uh, in Sweden and stuff like that, maybe you know they can also be uh, you know use the Western or education, whatever, and then uh, technology and so forth. So integrating uh, into that system will be also very important, I think. So I think uh, creating some kind of internship program would be also very important for the youth and stuff like that in the diaspora, African diaspora and so forth. So uh, thank you, thank you for giving us uh, a lot of ideas and also the information uh, of uh, Comesa, ECOWAS, or um, SADEC, and all the different groups. Um, and also about business. I mean, uh, we need to be able to integrate, um, you know, uh, a lot of things. Uh, uh, so you give us uh, uh, very informative, loaded <laughs> uh, information. So, um, and hopefully uh, you'll come back again and, uh, and talk to us. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for Ruth. having me. Okay, no problem. As always. Keep up doing a great job. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.